Good morning. Um, today we are going to be holding um, public hearings on a number of items. Uh, if you're here to testify on any of the items on the calendar, uh, please fill out a white slip with the Sergeant at Arms and indicate the name of the application you wish to testify on on that slip. Uh, our first hearing will be on the pre-considered LU's O'Neill's rezoning uh, for property in Council Member Holden's district in Queens. Uh, all of the property in the rezoning area is currently zoned R4. Uh, the zonings to R5D, uh, R5D and C2, uh, and R4, C22 uh, would bring existing buildings into zoning compliance and as to the project site located on the corner of 53rd Drive and 65th Place would allow the enlargement of O'Neill's restaurant in addition to a partial second floor to be used uh, for catering is proposed. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and I would like to call up uh, Nora Martins to testify. Council, will you swear the applicant in? Please state your name and um, then make the affirmation. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Nora Martins, I do. Good morning, Chair Moya. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Nora Martins. I'm from Ackerman LLP, representing the applicant, O'Neill's Restaurant, in the proposed rezoning. You'll hear a little bit from the owner shortly, but O'Neill's is a family-owned and operated uh, eating and drinking establishment in Maspeth, Queens, that's been operating at this location for over 80 years. They have been a neighborhood fixture, holding functions like bridal showers, baby showers, in addition to normal restaurant and bar capacity, and also hosting hosting many events for charities, uh, including NYPD and, and service members, and they employ over 70 people, mostly from the local community. The proposed zoning map amendment that's the subject of this application would legalize O'Neill's, which is non-conforming commercial establishment. It's located in an R4 zoning district. It's not permitted as of right, and would also permit a modest enlargement to the existing one-story restaurant. In addition to O'Neill's restaurant, the rezoning area includes seven other properties, seven other adjacent properties at the intersection. Uh, it would legalize other non-conforming commercial uses, as well as bring a non-complying residential building adjacent to the restaurant into greater compliance with existing zoning. You can see on the area map the uh, parcels that are included within the proposed rezoning, which are all located on at the intersection of 53rd Drive and 65th Place. O'Neill's is on the corner. Uh, the uh, four-story multiple dwelling is located on 53rd Drive next to O'Neill's. And along either side of 65th Place, there are uh, two-story mixed-use commercial and residential buildings. The area has been, rezoned R has been zoned R4 since 1961, which does not reflect the existing conditions. The photos here show the existing one-story O'Neill's restaurant, along with the four-story residential building. And these photos show either side of 65th place, the two-story uh, non-conforming mixed-use buildings. The proposed zoning map amendment um, proposes to change the existing R4 zoning district to several different zoning districts uh, to closely match the existing development without facilitating additional development other than a small extension to the existing restaurant. The uh, O'Neill's site would be rezoned to an R5D zoning district with a C22 commercial overlay. Um, the adjacent residential property would be rezoned to an R5D without a commercial overlay. And then the other six properties would be, would remain R4, but a C22 commercial overlay would be mapped over those properties. The proposed zoning change map illustrates uh, the, these zoning changes. And the proposed development that would be, oh, sorry, that would be facilitated by the rezoning would be a partial second floor addition to the restaurant 
approximately 4,335 square feet. It will be used as an accessory banquet hall with a maximum of 140 seats. And the enlargement would increase the size of the existing restaurant to 12,530 square feet, just under 1.5 FAR. And the proposed building height would be 25 feet, one inch. The site plan illustrates the proposed enlargement, which would be about half of uh, the existing footprint of the building. Uh, does not maximize the two FAR that would be permitted under the proposed rezoning, given the constraints of complying with parking requirements. Uh, no parking can be provided on site, given the existing building's full footprint build out. My last slide just shows a proposed elevation of uh, the proposed enlargement of the restaurant. The rezoning application was approved by Community Board 5 and by the Queensborough President with some conditions. It's also approved by the City Planning Commission. Uh, we've received letters in support from nine neighbors that are immediately across the street or adjacent to the property. A uh, petition with more than 200 signatures in support as well as about 70, over 70 comments uh, in support that were submitted to City Planning. And that's in addition to public testimony and support that was given throughout the public hearing process. That concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I just have uh, two quick questions. Um, just can you go back and, and, and talk a little bit about um, what's being done to alleviate the parking concerns in the neighborhood? Yes. So throughout the process, um, parking has been a concern. I think it's a, sort of an existing condition concern in the neighborhood. And so uh, O'Neill's and striving to be a good neighbor has committed to, they, they use valet parking, that's how they accommodate their parking needs, and they've committed to identifying several other locations where they could put additional parking uh, locations in the, in the neighborhood in the event of larger functions that would utilize, for example, the new proposed banquet hall on the second floor. They've identified five locations that could accommodate together over 130 cars as necessary. Okay. And you can confirm that it's only going to be used for commercial purposes? The, the existing site? Yeah. Yes, yes. The restaurant has been there for over 80 years. It was actually recently rebuilt only a few years ago after a significant fire. So it's a big investment. It's family owned, and, and they intend to keep it commercial in perpetuity. OK, thank you. Thank you. Next panel, uh, I'd like to call Dan uh, Pyle, Allison Vanetta, Tom Prati, Jimmy McNamara, and Tom McBride. Thank you. Uh, you can just state your name and we can begin. You just have to press the button. All right. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Danny Pyle. I'm the proprietor at O'Neill's. My family's run this place for over 70 years. I've been running it myself for about 25. Uh, we're, we're, you know, a staple in the neighborhood. We're a neighborhood place that, you know, goes hand in hand with Maspeth. If you heard of Maspeth, you heard of O'Neill's. Uh, we, we're involved with everything in the neighborhood from the Lions Club, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Kiwanis Club, do all their functions. We're members. We get involved with, you know, whatever's best for the neighborhood, involved with the schools, sponsoring. Uh, you know, we just do a lot of stuff like that. We uh, also get involved with the NYPD. We have their Widows and Orphans Christmas party there every year. Uh, we also do functions with St. Jude every year. We do a big St. Jude event. So, uh, you know, we give a lot. We try to do, the, you know, our best to help people in the neighborhood as it's a good, strong, family-orientated neighborhood and place. So uh, there's a big demand for catering, and with this second floor, it's going to help us and the neighborhood, you know, with that, and it's going to create more jobs, and, uh, you know, we're just, you know, looking forward to possibly, you know, moving forward with this project. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Allison Venata. I live across the street from O'Neill's. My family has owned the house for several generations. I myself have lived there since I was a kid. I've been going to O'Neill's since I was a kid with my father when it was smaller. Uh, it's been a fixture in the neighborhood as long as I've been there. I've used their services for my daughter's showers, my communions, all different parties throughout the years, so as most of my family members. As someone who lives directly across the street in one of the only private houses literally across the street, I have never experienced any issues with parking or anything outside of the norm. We've had issues when they were closed with parking, but nothing has gotten any worse. I would say that it stayed pretty much the same. Um, they do a lot of charity events for the community. I've seen those firsthand. It's, it's a great place. It's fairly quiet. I mean, I eat there all the time. I go there because it's a nice, quiet place to be. It's a lot of neighborhood people, and we don't really have any trouble out there, not that I've ever seen. That's it. I think a second floor would be great. I think it'll be, bring more business to the neighborhood. I think it would be an awesome idea. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tom Brady. I also live across the street from O'Neill's at 5417, right on 65th place. I'm a lifelong resident of Maspit and have lived there for 61 years. This morning, I not only speak for myself, but I speak for my mother, Florence Brady, who's 90 years old and owned that home since 1940. <clears throat> um, we live directly across the street from O'Neill's, like I say. I come here before you this morning to express our approved approval of the said addition and rezoning. O'Neill's has been a part of the community since 1933 <clears throat> as, <clears throat> as well as an outstanding neighbor. We have seen firsthand over the years the many functions and benefits that are held there. Although there are many, most noteworthy are what they do for the children and widows of the FDNY, the NYPD. <clears throat> As long as, as well as St. Jude's. In closing, I would like to thank you for your time, letting me voice my opinion in this matter. I hope you will take into consideration all I have told you this morning in thank making you. your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tom McBride. I live at a 5348 65th place right around the corner from O'Neill's. I've been living there about in the Mad neighborhood for about 10, 15 years. I'm a local three electrician, and since, unfortunately, we had that catastrophe down around the corner, 9-11, this man's been helping everybody survive through that. You have functions, you have benefits, you have things that go on that without the community, without this, without this place, it would be a lot more different. As far as the parking goes, I hear that's a big issue. Every time you go to one of these things, they worry about parking, parking. I live in a community driveway. I can tell you right now that there's 15 houses that rent their spaces to commercial companies to help provide for their income. Now, whether that's good or bad for the community or for that person, that's not for us to call. But for them to keep using this as a kind of like a scapegoat to say that he steals parking spaces, it seems very inconsiderate and kind of foolish. Everybody in that community, if you live in a community driveway, you have a two-car garage and two spaces behind your house. If you have enough people to, let, to pick up those four spaces, that's a lot. But you're not parking out in the street. He's not stealing spaces from the street. He's got a valet service that parks in the community down on Maurice Avenue, in places where it's more commercialized to, to, help, to help the people of the neighborhood not have this issue. So I understand that there is an opposition about that, but again, with the jobs he's going to create, the taxes you're going to get from it, and the actual community that's going to come together more and have that more of a benefit to, to have him be able to provide, that it's, it's, it's no, more, no answer for me that, but to let this happen. I hope you all approve and see what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Jim McNamara. I just want to reiterate what they have said. It's been a staple of the neighborhood for over 100 years. I can't say enough of good things about the O'Neill and the Pyle family. And I would just love to see this go through for him to expand the restaurant. If it's good for the neighborhood, it's good for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as a lifelong Queens resident and someone who has visited your establishment. Uh, we wish you lots of luck, uh, and thank you for coming here um, to testify in front of us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application, and it will be laid over.
Uh, we will now go uh, back to vote on uh, several applications that we previously heard. Uh, we will vote to approve LUs 188 and 189, uh, the 5563 Summit Street application in Council Member Landers District in Brooklyn. Uh, applicant uh, PhD Summit LLC seeks to rezone the property from uh, M11 to R6B and apply MIH options one and two. Uh, the rezoning will facilitate the development of approximately 14 apartments and community facilities with four to five affordable units, uh, depending upon the MIH option chosen. Uh, we will uh, be voting uh, to approve with modifications LUs 190 and 191, the 205 Park Avenue rezoning, uh, the property in Majority Leader uh, Member Cumbo's district in Brooklyn, uh, applicant 462 Lexington Avenue LLC seeks, uh, seeks to rezone the property from an M12 to an R7D uh, slash C24 and to apply MIH options one and two. Our modifications to the zoning text will be removed, uh, will be to remove MIH option two and to add the deep affordability option. Uh, this was, uh, this will facilitate the development of an eight-story mixed-use building with approximately 17 affordable units under MIH option one. Uh, we will be voting to approve five uh, Beeman Avenue rezoning, uh, LUs 195 for property in council member Rose's district in Staten Island. Applicant uh, Pelton Place LLC seeks to uh, seeks an extension of an existing C22 commercial overlay uh, to the project site to facilitate the development of a one-story commercial retail building with accessory parking. Uh, I will now call for a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local council members to approve LUs 188, 189, 190, and 195, and to approve with the modifications I have described for LU 191. Uh, council, uh, please call the roll. Moya. Ayanol. Constantinides. Ayanol. Lansman. Aye. Rivera. Aye. Gredenchik. The land use items are approved by a vote of five in the affirmatives, no negatives and no abstentions, and we will leave the vote open. Our uh, next hearing will be on uh, pre-considered LU uh, 3122 and 3136 Victory Boulevard application for property in Council Member Matteo's district in Staten Island. Uh, applicant CNA Realty Holdings LLC seeks a rezoning to replace an existing uh, R3X uh, C22 district with a C81 district to legalize an existing automobile repair establishment and to increase the size of the facility. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application uh, and I'd like to call up uh, Adam uh, Rothkrug. Thank you. One second. Council, um, please swear the panel. Um, before answering, please state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Adam Rothkrug, I do. Give your, give your name. Just say Bob Robert Schuster. Schuster, project architect. Say I do. I do. <laughs> you, you, may, you may begin. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Moyer, members of the uh, council. Uh, this application is made on behalf of CNA Realty Holding, the owner of the development site, for a zoning map amendment from R3X C22 to C81. The proposed project area is located in the Bull's Head section of Staten Island, community, dis community district number two, and includes one development site at 3122 to 30 Victory Boulevard uh, between Richmond Avenue and Jones Street. Uh, and it includes two additional sites not owned by the owner, uh, also proposed to be included in the rezoning. 
The owner's uh, site consists of three sites. Non-conforming automobile, automobile uses were established on the main site prior to 1961, and it's a legally non-conforming use at the present time. It has a C of O dating back to 1948 for a garage and five, for five commercial vehicles, and in 1987 started use as a repair shop. Uh, the Victory Auto Center has been operating at this location for 30 years, serving the local community, and the rezoning is sought to permit the expansion of their existing repair shop. They do Geico work on Staten Island and uh, badly need the proposed uh, addition. Uh, they have two other sites adjacent. One was previously used as a car wash. Uh, which was approved by the Board of Standards and Appeals. Uh, that approval expired and they're using it for accessory parking now and they have another parking lot that they've been using to store uh, vehicles seeking repair. This area was uh, rezoned in 2011 uh, when the city added a, commercial, a C22 commercial overlay uh, as part of the uh, uh, commercial corridor rezoning on Staten Island. Uh, this C22, while permitting commercial use, didn't reflect the auto uses that are predominant on this side of uh, Victory Boulevard, so it didn't leave uh, CNA uh, or the Victory Auto Center with the ability to enlarge their existing facility. Uh, the exist their existing building is about 5,000 square feet in area, and the proposed uh, rezoning uh, would permit them to approximately double the size we're not proposing any new spray booths. Uh, it'll be used purely for uh, predominantly uh, insurance company auto repairs of uh, vehicles. Uh, the owners, uh, Cesar Alia and uh, Anthony LaCava are here, as well as the uh, architect, Robert Schuster, to answer any questions that the uh, uh, council may have. Thank you. Uh, council Member Matteo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for both for coming. Uh, I, I uh, have some concerns and some questions I just want to go over. Um, as you know, the, one of the first um, issues that we talked about in the past were the issue of billboards and deed restrictions. Um, Borough President and I have uh, been on the same page about filing a deed restriction so billboards aren't placed like they are in Route 9 in Jersey or even Holland Boulevard in my district. Um, so I just want to know where we are in that process. Sure. So uh, this issue came to light uh, at, when we met with the borough president's office. We hadn't even considered it. We obviously have no desire or intent to uh, erect any billboards, uh, but obviously the uh, uh, council's concerned and everyone is concerned with the other owners. So we've been working with the two other affected property owners uh, and with the borough president's office to uh, 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 come up with a restricted declaration that would be recorded against the properties uh, that would limit uh, the placement of any signage to the current C22 regulations so that no billboards would be uh, uh, permitted. Uh, we don't have a signed agreement yet, but we're working very hard uh, and we know that that's uh, important to the council that we have that in place before a vote on this matter. So are the other two owners a part of the application or you're dealing with the, them the, as the, sort of like like a subcontractor or yeah so the other two owners property was included uh, at the suggestion uh, in determining where to draw the zoning lines from city planning they are not actively involved as part of the application uh, it's a small island and a small block so we know the other owners we've discussed the situation with them with regard to the owner next to us he has a a non-conforming car wash. So he is uh, stuck with us under the current zoning, not being able to enlarge it or make any improvements to his property. So the C8 district helps him a lot, uh, as well as us, by allowing him to expand. So he's been uh, very amenable to uh, uh, agreeing to this restriction on signage. He has no desire to put billboards. Uh, the Tim Hortons, uh, the owner of the Tim Hortons property on the corner, uh, that owner will continuing to work with. Uh, they have no desire or need to put billboards, uh, but uh, you know they've been a little harder to negotiate with with regard to signing an actual uh, restrictive declaration. So uh, 
because of the holiday, we were a little delayed, but we're actively working with both those owners and uh, have been keeping the council's uh, council uh, advised as to our progress. Okay, good. Let's keep in communication about that. Um, I don't know if you said it before I got here, I was in a meeting downstairs, but do you have any, I mean, are you can, with the rezoning, do you have the, um, a project that you're considering right now, or is this just for the future? Is this expansion? Have you filed anything? No, we have an actual project that involves a, about a 5,000 square foot enlargement uh, okay. to the existing facility. Uh, so, yeah, we have plans that we've shared with the uh, uh, community board and borough president. Just wanted to hear it on the record since I was here. Um, so, a big issue for me, and I, I think you, you, uh, everyone is understanding where I am on on a widening uh, here. It's it's. A very, very big issue from here. Uh, the Tim Hortons on the corner has a widening at the intersection that has been extremely beneficial uh, to traffic congestion. Um, this intersection and, and the, the thoroughfare Victory Boulevard down Arlene's very congested. We have parking lots coming out from the McDonald's lot across the street that uh, people make illegal lefts and, and right. So, um, so much to know that DOT at one point wanted to ban lefts, which we fought against. Um, to turn on Richmond Avenue. With that said, I think there is uh, certainly a, a need and opportunity here to widen Victory Boulevard as part of this project. It's something that I am 110% um, in favor of, so I want to hear from you where you are on that. Have you spoken with DOT? Have you provided a BPP, uh, an application? Where are we on that? So. Uh in connection with filing for a uh, sewer permit, we had previously filed the BPP and uh, the DOT had not required a widening of our property. But we went through the hearings and meetings and obviously we're all familiar with this intersection uh, so that uh, we understand your desire uh, uh, to, have the, to have the widening done at this point. So we are, with regard to our property, we're amenable to doing whatever DOT says you have to, we have to do and would have to be done as part of our uh, uh, in proposed enlargement. Uh, we have not been able to meet with the DOT yet to discuss the amended uh, BPP. Uh, we are hoping we will have a meeting with Mr. Coca-Cola this week uh, and, our, uh, and our engineer. Uh, once we know what, what DOT envisions as far as the widening and how it's going to taper into the existing widening, uh, then we can also go to our neighbor, the car wash again, and uh, dis discuss with him what, it, what the impact would be on his property. Obviously, if he wants to in, uh, improve his property in the near future, he would have to do the widening also. If we can do the whole thing at once now, uh, that would obviously be our desire. Uh, but, you know, our position has always been we will do whatever DOT uh, requests, and hopefully, uh, as I said, we'll have that meeting this week. Uh, I know uh, the Commissioner Coca-Cola is aware that this project is in the midst of active hearings and he's been cooperative. Again, just due to vacation schedules, it's been delayed. So uh, once we have uh, that meeting and can resolve what they're looking for, uh, you know, we're obviously happy to cooperate. And again, we're hoping to uh, be able to convince our neighbor uh, at the car wash to cooperate. The widening's already been done by the Tim Horton property, so uh, there's... So the neighbor, uh, the, the other owner, the car wash owner is not, you haven't discussed this yet with him? Or? We, we have discussed it in theory. Uh, again, the problem is that since we don't know how the widening would lay out right now, we haven't been able to give them anything concrete. So we're hoping after we meet with uh, Commissioner Coca-Cola that then we can have some... Uh, Okay. Uh, substantive discussions. Yeah, we'll be in touch with, with the borough commissioner. I think he just ca came back yes. from vacation it, today. So, and then our engineer um, was away for a day. The winding's paramount for me, it, um, so uh, we need to have further discussions as we move forward in this process. I, I thank you for coming and for answering my questions, and we will certainly have uh, much more discussions as we move forward. Thank you for your thank help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, before I call up the next panel, I want to acknowledge the always punctual uh, Richie Torres and uh, Steve Levin. Uh, also, uh, Antonio Reynoso uh, are here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. Is I always, always. 
Uh, well, we're moving on now. Thank you. Uh, so we are going to open up uh, the the vote. Uh, council, please call the rolls. Vote to approve land use items 188, 189, 190, and 195, and to approve 191 with modifications. Levin. Aye on all. Reynoso. Aye on all. Torres. I vote aye on all. Uh, the vote stands at eight in the affirmative, no negative, and no abstentions. Amy. And we'll leave the vote open. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we are going to. Uh, the best. Our next hearing will be on the pre-considered LUs uh, uh, 1881 and 1883 McDonald Avenue rezoning for property in Council Member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. Uh, applicant Quinton Plaza LLC seeks to rezone property from uh, R5 to R7A uh, C24 and apply MIH options one and two to the rezonings uh, are to facilitate a new eight-story building with approximately 35 apartments and ground floor commercial space with approximately 11 affordable units under MIH options two. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and I will call up the panel of Eric Palatnik. Good morning. And, and council, please uh, swear in the panelists. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. You Good morning. Go. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Eric Palatnik. I don't know if the presentation is up on your board. I don't see it on the, uh, on the electronics. Uh, would you like it? I have an extra USB if anybody would like to. What would you like to Okay. So the application we're presenting to you for is a uh, rezoning. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's at the corner of Quinton and McDonald Avenue. It's a rezoning from an. Up, oh, I have an extra one too. How are you? I have handouts too. Would you like me to hand those to you? Hold on. I just went on vacation with my kids. I spent everything technological they did for me, so I didn't have to touch anything like this. It was great. They proceeded to tell me my iPhone 6 is outdated. I was happy I had an iPhone. There we go. Great. All right, great. All right, so now the picture's worth a thousand words, right? So good morning again. We'll start over. My name is Eric Palatnik. I'm an attorney representing the owner of the property, and we hope everybody had a great summer vacation. Uh, it's a rezoning, as you can tell, from an R5 to an R7A with a C24 overlay, which we believe is uh, really appropriate here at this location on McDonald Avenue, which uh, it's across from a C8 district. It's, uh, this stretch of McDonald has long been uh, underdeveloped. Uh, it's really had a more of a uh, haphazard manufacturing automotive heritage and has resulted on this development site, as well as uh, the one across the street that's within the rezoning area, of uh, one and two story mid-century buildings that are uh, rather uh, underutilized. So we're up against, as you can tell, of course, the elevated rail with the F train. We're a block away from uh, the train station at Avenue P. And uh, we presented this application for a rezoning. It will, if approved, uh, 
will allow for a 48,000 square foot building that will, residential building, that will have 42,000 square feet of residential floor area, about 5,000 square feet of commercial floor area, the ground floor, 15 parking spaces at the cellar. Uh, it will be uh, a f partially affordable building. Uh, it will have option two is what we're proposing at 80% AMI. And Tim Henze, who's prepared the, uh, f the affordability matrix, is here to speak to you about that more if you have any questions. Uh, going through just the presentation, you can see here we have the uh, area highlighted on the left is the existing zoning at R5 in the OP subdistrict, and ours is on the right is the proposed showing uh, the two corners to be R7A. You'll note across the street it's CA2, which is what I was speaking to before about McDonald Avenue. It's really a mix. You got R5 on one side of the street and CA2 on the other, and it's really a leftover from 1961. Uh, here again, you can just see the area in question, uh, the rezoning area on a tax map. Uh, nothing new for you to see here. An area map, and I'll just bring you in a little bit uh, onto the property. This shows you the rezoning sites uh, that are in question. On the top right, uh, you have uh, the lower site, which is uh, uh, an Anderson Windows building. It's called Brickles, Brooklyn Windows and Doors. Uh, and then clicking through, if this can catch up. Uh, these are some of the development sites around us, some of the taller buildings in the area. Uh, and this is the development on the top, or excuse me, is a, get to the development site, here you go. This is a view of the development site from McDonald Avenue. You can see what I was speaking to before, sort of a mix and match of buildings that have been built over the last, the early part of the last century. Uh, you have a, a guy that makes hats in the top floor, a rather older gentleman uh, who's ready to retire. Uh, and uh, that's his shop down in the lower left corner as well where he's got shoes. Uh, this is a site next door to us. It's a four-story building, as you can tell, and there's more shots of, of the elevated rail. This is the development site itself. This gives you the generic information about the development. It's an eight-story building, as I said before, with 48,000 square feet of floor area. Uh, going to the, afford the affordable units, as you can see down in the lower left corner, there will be a total of 35 dwelling units, 11 of which will be affordable. Uh, this sheet I'll allow you to look through on your own. It gives you the matrix for the affordability. Uh, the same here. And this just starts to walk you through the floor plans, which I'll be happy to go into. And the architect is here as well uh, to go through it. I'll bring it to the end where you can start to get some imagery of the building and get an idea for what it will look like. This gives you a view from uh, Quinton. It shows you on the right side, we have a generous setback that's uh, up against the R5 district. So there's a 50, there's actually a 36-foot uh, separation at that point. Uh, you could also see there the garage door that will be to the parking area. And you could also see some of the, uh, the residential uh, uh, entrance right there as well. Uh, this gives you another view of it from McDonald, looking at the corner of Quinton. Uh, and this is a shot looking at the streetscape from McDonald. And, uh, that's a view from above, a bird's eye view. We'd be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Our development team is here, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, just, a, just a few questions. Uh, how many tenants uh, would be displaced as a result of uh, this development project? There is one house that has a large family with has, uh, it appears multiple people, multiple people living within the building. Uh, we don't know if they're all related or not. There's about 10 people within that, within that space. That's uh, the building that will be the home that I showed you before. Uh, so they're selling the home or? No, the home is a rental. They, they're on a month to month tenancy right now with the owner. Got it. Are there any relocation plans for those tenants? Yes. The owner of this building also owns other properties and he's making available to them uh, other units within the area. So he'll be attempting to relocate them if they're happy with them. I'm sure they will be. They're actually much nicer than what they're in right now. And can you just go over the AMI ranges for the development again for me? Sure. Uh, and uh, Tim Henze is here. If I can invite him to come up as well, if you'd like. Sure. Uh, he actually prepared them. Tim, if you, I'll actually be better if you speak to this issue because you're here. It's working. No, it's working. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Henze. One, one, one second. Just sure. uh, the council will swear you in. You have to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you'll answer our qu all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. Uh, so I did the, uh, I worked with Eric to work, uh, do the distribution under uh, option two of the MIH program. So we have uh, identified 11 of the 35 units as affordable and with an average uh, AMI range of 80% AMI. Right now we are showing uh, three units at 60% uh, AMI 
and those include two, 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 two bedrooms and one three bedroom. We have four units at 80% AMI, and that's uh, three two bedroom units and one uh, four bedroom unit. And we have four units at 100% AMI, and that is uh, one one bedroom and three two bedrooms. Okay. And uh, I also see, uh, Chairman, that you're taking notes. The uh, handouts that came to you have a, what I call a cheat sheet, an old school cheat sheet on top of it, and uh, that's got uh, at the bottom of it all the pertinent information that uh, Mr. Henze just spoke to, so for ease of your note taking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to call up the next panel. Uh, Roslyn, go. If I may, these, this is the architect and the uh, environmental consultant, so if you don't have any further questions for them, they, they don't. Hi, Hiram Roth Rothkirk. Yeah. No, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item or the previous item um, on Victory Boulevard? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearings uh, on both applications and uh, they will be laid over. Our next hearing will be on pre-considered LU 27 East 4th Street, the property in Council Member Rivera's district in Manhattan. Uh, applicant uh, Caladop Park Corporation seeks a zoning text amendment to special permit 74712 uh, and seeks two special permits under that section to allow a transient uh, hotel and retail use at the project site and to modify bulk regulations to allow the proposed building to reach a height of 90 feet uh, without setback. Uh, uh, and now I'm gonna call up the, the panel. Uh, Jeremiah Ken, Kendra? Kendra, yeah. Kendra, sorry. Uh, Michael Kramer? Here. Gary uh, Spindler? And Carl Rob, Rob, Robinacker? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council, will you please swear in the panel? Um, before responding, please each state your name. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Uh, please state your name into the mic and say you do. Jeremiah Kandriva, I do. Please hit the red button. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Jeremiah Kandriva, I do. Gary Spindler, I do. Carl Rubenacker, I do. Michael Kramer, I do. You may begin. Okay, thank you. Just trying to zoom this full screen mode. Okay, thank you. Uh, 27 East 4th Street is a one-story existing building. It's in the, uh, it's in the uh, NoHo uh, Historic District Extension. Uh, we've been going through the process of approval since 2011 with landmarks and the city planning and with the uh, oversight from buildings and the parks department. And I'm gonna ask Jed to describe the, uh, the land use matter that's before you today. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, Mr. Chairperson and members of the committee, thank you for providing us with the opportunity to testify today on this proposal. The proposal before you is to construct an eight-story contextual street wall building at 27 East 4th Street. The development would be utilized for either Use Group 5 transient hotel with approximately 28 units or Use Group 6 office building 
above the level of the second story, both of which are uses are as of right. Um, the uses located or to be located below the level of the second story include ground floor, um, ex on the ground floor include a, an accessory lobby for the hotel or office use, as well as a small neighborhood restaurant with approximately 25 tables, plus or minus an occupancy of 100 persons. Um, the seller level is to be utilized for either use group five or use group six. Accessory use is back of the house, hotel, office space, storage. Um, we are adjacent to the Merchant's House Museum, which is a individual landmark structure of both exterior and interior. Because the site is located within the NoHo Historic District Extension, the demolition of the existing one-story building and the design and the construction of the proposed building required Landmarks Preservation Commission approval, which was received on April 8, 2014, when Landmarks voted to approve the demolition of the existing building and the construction of the proposed building. Further, on April 6, 2018, the Landmarks Preservation Commission issued a design-only certificate of appropriateness for the building. The zoning approvals that are before you today consist of three actions. A text amendment to the provisions of Zoning Resolution Section 74712, as well as a special permit under 74712A for uses to be located below the level of the second story, as well as a special permit pursuant to 74712B for heightened setback waivers. If you observe the um, the graphic uh, on your screen or on page six of the handout, you will see that the setback um, that we require to produce a contextual street wall building starts at um, uh, the sixth story. Zoning resolution requires us to set back at 85, the lesser of 85 feet or six stories. And so we are requesting a waiver on the seventh and eighth floor. If you see the hatch portion, it's in the initial setback distance which is to a depth of 20 feet. That's the extent of the waiver that we're seeking under 74712B. Um, I would like to speak to you uh, momentarily about the history of 74712 because I do think it's extraordinarily relevant to the actions that are before you. 74712 in 1997 was modified by the City Planning Commission to apply for bulk regulations only on vacant lots uh, within historic districts. And at that time, the compendium report the Commission adopted with respect to 9706540Y, the Commission stated, quote, believes that the new tool may help promote development of buildings that are more contextual to historic districts than buildings that might be developed as of right pursuant to existing zoning. I note that exactly what the applicant is doing in this proposal. We are developing an LPC approved contextual street wall building with massing that is more consistent with the historic district than an as of right heightened setback building. I also note that the provisions of 74712 have been amended over the last 20 years to include use waivers as well as bulk waivers applying in historic districts in both the M15A and the M15B zones. An example of this are zoning amendments that occurred in 2003 and 2006 that, are used, that, that permitted use in bulk regulations on land with minor improvements or sites where not more than 20 percent was occupied by an existing building. In the Commission's report of 2003 with respect to the property located at 465 Broadway, the Commission noted that, quote, it does not believe that the replacement of any of these buildings with new structures approved by landmarks would be adverse to the historic district and contrary to public policy. Recent approvals of new structures in historic districts by the Landmarks Commission demonstrate how these can be compatible with the historic character of the district. The Commission stated further in its 2006 report with respect to the special permit application for 311 West Broadway that it believes the modifications of bulk would be compatible to the scale and character of the surrounding NoHo neighborhood and the Commission noted that the design of the proposed building results from changes that were made at the request of landmarks and which led to the subject request for bulk modifications and that they respond to the scale and context of the surrounding area. This again is what the applicant is proposing, a contextual street wall building as opposed to a heightened setback building. It was approved by the Landmarks Commission um, with massing that resulted in 
the process with Landmarks Preservation Commission. Our original building was, was taller than what we're proposing now. Um, I also note that the commission in that application disagreed with the community board's recommendation to maintain existing street law requirements and, and noted that it would conflict with the original intent of this section. I'll, I'll sum up, there are two other um, uh, uh, relevant considerations of the City Planning Commission with respect to amendments and special permits under 74712. Those occurred 2013 and 2016. With respect to the application at 300 Lafayette Street, the Commission noted that I believe that vacant lots and, and undeveloped sites, excuse me, in these areas detract from the fabric of the Soho cast iron and the NoHo historic districts, and that, that allowing modifications of the use and bulk regulations by special permit would facilitate development of the vacant underutilized sites and help strengthen the historic districts built character. And in the last and most recent amendment, 74712 at 150 Wooster Street, the commission noted that the expanded applicability of the zoning text would provide enhanced opportunities to fill in gaps along Soho's mid-blocks and avenues to reinforce its scale, street wall, contiguity, and predominant built-out character. Again, this is exactly what the applicant is proposing to do, and fill in the gap that exists with the existing one-story mid-block building and replace it with a new landmarks approved contextual street wall building. Um, I would like to note for the record that the City Planning Commission unanimously approved this application and that the applicant meets each and every findings with respect to 74A, uh, 74712A and 74712B respectively. Um, I'd like to turn it back to Michael if there are no questions of me at this time. So a one-story building which currently houses hot dog vendors who are on month-to-month -month leases was built back in 1931. So you can see it's an old building that we consider not, uh, not to be contributing to the historic extension. Originally, our, this is a, a rendering of what our building will look like between the Merchant's House, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, and 29 East 4th Street, 25, excuse me, East 4th Street, which is a residential nine-story building, which is to the left. We've been at this for a while, and you know, the building has evolved from 11 to 10 to nine, and now down to eight stories, as Jed just described. And Jed just described the zoning actions that were needed and the setback waiver that's needed and we'd like to talk about first the, the building to our west, which is 20, 25 East 4th Street. I'm sorry, that's, that's wrong. It should be 25. Um, that building uh, is residential. It has lot line windows. Uh, it was originally a joint living working building. Uh, there is a restrictive declaration on those lot line windows. So some members of that building may lose uh, some light and air. Perhaps that light now was used for um, rooms that were um, that were otherwise inhabited, and so there's been a, there's been some concern from that building about us. We've worked with them as closely as we can to limit the number of lot line windows that would be blocked. Merchant House itself, of course, is dates back to the 1830s and 1832, and of course, it's a New York City landmark and one of the first New York City landmarks. And we've been a very good neighbor to Merchant's House during the period of time that we've owned this building, which is almost 20 years. Uh, back, as, back in 2010, the Parks Department uh, found $598,000 to uh, do some restoration work in the Merchant's House. There have been emergency maintenance, there's been emergency repairs. Uh, clearly, over the years, there have been repairs to keep Merchant's House going, and as much as we respect the original uh, fabric and, 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 and interiors of Merchant House, we would like to point out that they have been repaired over the years as well. Our pre-development plans anticipate extraordinary efforts. We've had our site safety plan vetted by three different firms. We have GMS structural engineering with Carl here on our staff since 
2013, working with his counterparts at New York City Parks and New York City Department of Buildings and with the Merchant's House Mu Museum. We've done pre-monitoring vibration analysis, so soil borings, uh, the, arch the archaeologist was in, and mostly we've, we've been trying to come up with a plan that would minimize any concerns for Merchant's House. Some of the, the ways we wish to, merge, to minimize those concerns were to create a special uh, plan for the foundation where we're literally set back for, from Merchant House's um, foundation six or seven feet in the zone of influence so that we don't disturb the soil and the foundation of Merchant's House. And if there are questions about that, Carl can answer them further. We have a common wall that, excuse me, we have an, uh, our east wall is a remnant from the building that was there prior to 1931. Now, upon the recommendation of our, our engineering staff, we are going to leave that wall in place, even though it, it subtracts some of the, the leasable space from our proposed building. That wall um, will provide a, a good deal of stability to Merchant House during our construction process, but we will we'll continue to provide uh, stability will be that we will continue to, to maintain that one-story building as we are digging out our foundation as easily as possible. And that by keeping the rooftop there, we, we will be able to keep the rain and the water um, out of a construction, out of a typical construction site, just again so that there would be a very little shift in the sediment um, as we do our work. We're going to use hand tools wherever possible in conformance with the building code. And we'd like to point out that there was a study done by a geotechnical engineer back in 2012, which was based upon an old design of our building. And that building has been updated with all of the, the different um, uh, uh, suggestions that have been made in the past couple of years, so that I think everybody agrees that that, built, that study is out of date, and we understand that Merchant House would like to uh, create a new study, and we have offered to pay for that study and engage the, uh, the geotechnical engineers if that would be helpful as well. Our support of the excavation and construction sequence will be as we, as we begin to demolish our building, of course, we'll put in supporting structures, and again, we can talk about that from an engineering point of view. Uh, we're going to cantilever protection over the roof to catch any falling objects, minimize vibrations. We're going to incorporate the external chimney of Merchant House into our internal shaft way to preserve the look and the integrity of Merchant's House. This is uh, an example of the scaffolding plan that we have for the neighboring buildings. This is an example of some of the monitoring points that we will be using. Our M&P plan has been approved by the buildings department. The parks department asked that we do a comprehensive pre-construction condition survey. Uh, we've had a conversation with parks as, uh, as, as late as uh, about a week ago and we've informed them that we would like to walk through Merchant's House and do a, um, a initial walkthrough so that we can create a scope of work for that pre-construction construction condition survey. Uh, we want to point out, as Landmarks pointed out, that the Commission routinely approves new construction adjacent to historic buildings. We're really not reinventing the wheel here. We are um, pleased that the Commission recognizes that uh, the excavation will be supervised by professional licensed engineers. Um, the, our engineering firm, GMS, is recommended by the New York Landmarks Conservancy under their find a professional engineer, and Carl can speak more to that as well. Uh, we also are following DOB's recommendations uh, that uh, the design engineers be acceptable to parks and DOB in, in doing our M&P plan. Uh, GMS has proposed a plan that uh, exceeds the requirement of TPPN 10-88 for the Merchant's House. 
Uh, again, just to reemphasize the water runoff plan that we're using, the vibration monitoring that we will use, the step back foundation that we will use, maintaining the thick common wall, forfeiting uh, a tremendous, well, not a tremendous, a sub substantial buildable space, especially in the basement. And then we've been working with landmarks, DOB, parks, and elected officials to come up with a plan that can replace this problematic eyesore that before we start our construction activities, we expect to enter into an industry standard commercially reasonable construction protection agreement with our neighbors. We have met with Council Member Rivera and with Merchant House as recently as August the 13th. We've asked, uh, who has asked us to facilitate a meeting between our engineering uh, firm and theirs. Unfortunately, that has yet to be scheduled and yet to happen. We talked about engaging and updating the 2012 geotechnical technical plan. We're trying to be good neighbors. We're trying to go to extraordinary lengths. The project is literally shovel ready. And what's important here is that we deal in reality, not in hyperbole. Everybody loves and respects the merchant house. Nobody wants any harm to come to the merchant's house. We'll have all the appropriate uh, construction insurance that's needed and we need to have better communication with them, and we'll, of course, we need your approval today. So we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a few questions before I turn it over to Council Member Rivera. Uh, when building this project, uh, the foundation work is difficult and dangerous, and I see that you're talking about you'll excavate using hand tools. Can you tell us about the work you will do to protect uh, the workers during this process? Let me refer that to Carl. So during, during the excavation, um, when the excavation extends. Can you just speak into the yes, microphone? Yes, sorry. Yep. During the excavation, there will be a supportive excavation along the perimeter so that when the, when the excavation takes place, the workers will be protected, that, that's standard, that we're not doing anything different here than on another safe construction site. Um, there's soldier piles and lagging on the deeper parts, and, and that'll progress down as, as the excavation proceeds. Has there been any history before of any worker safety violations with any previous projects? On this site? What, what do you no, mean? with any one of your projects in the past. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't know. Can you just... No, I don't know. Yeah. You said none, right? Okay. Um, can you just walk me, just once again, um, how you intend to support the neighboring structure uh, during the process of uh, excavating the foundation? Carrie, you want to take that? If you want to call up the... Uh, we can and walk them through it. The two, the two drawings... The, 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 the cross-section up in the beginning of the presentation is, is helpful, that one. So this shows the cross-section on the right of the screen. You'll see the merchant house in, in pink. Um, there's the green wall in the middle. That is the shared wall between our properties. Mm -hmm. um, all the way on the left is 25 East 4th, also in pink. And then the construction site is in the middle. So basically what's going to happen is that the, right now it's, the site is filled in. There's, there's a slab on grade, and that's going to be excavated. It's going to be excavated in, in segments. As this excavation gets deep enough, there's a, a red brace that, that is going across the site that you see. Um, that's going to make sure that the walls can't move. And then not seen in this picture is that there's, there is um, soldier piles and lagging around the front and the sides where you see that blue step. That's going to be where the foundation is, is going to be constructed. You can see that the blue is level with the bottom of the green wall, so we're, we're not excavating below the wall until we step back um, multiple feet, over five feet. I would like to also add that all during the excavation, we have a one-story building. Speak into the microphone. Oh. I mean, thanks. I would like to just add that all during the excavation and foundation, we have a one-story building with a roof structure, with the roof structure that will all remain in place, adding stability to the Merchant's House Museum. Also, as you pass most construction sites, when you see a big pit, when it rains, it fills with water mm -hmm. at this site because we'll have the roof uh, on during the whole excavation and foundation. That'll keep the water away and will decrease the amount of effects on the neighboring buildings. 
uh, until we're ready to come through with the steel. Uh, and even when we start to come through with the steel and put on the floors, that roof will stay in place as long as possible. So we keep the water out of the structure. Okay. Um, and lastly, uh, you might have said this already, but what, what are the plans for the seller of the building? Uh, the plans are going to be, if it's going to be a hotel, it will be uh, back of house for the hotel, accessory uses, storage, and the same if, it's, uh, if it ends up to be a, a commercial office building, it will be probably storage units and mechanical rooms for the, uh, for the office use. Um, that's it for me. I oh, and also accessory use for the restaurant. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I will now turn it over to Councilman, uh, Councilwoman uh, Rivera. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, so as Chair Moya mentioned, uh, well, as you all mentioned, actually, uh, we have met before, and I've met with all the various stakeholders because of how important this building is, not just to the immediate community, but to the city. And I just think nationally, preservation-wise, this building is really, really important considering the exterior and interior landmarks. I think you went over that in the presentation on how much you respect what this building means, not just physically, but just uh, generally. And I, I see you do have a number of uh, preparations. I do just want to ask on the record, because this has come up, um, that you do own another property at 403 Lafayette Street, correct? That's correct. And why have you decided to build this hotel on 4th Street and not Lafayette, considering how fragile and, and the integrity of the building is? Oh, there are several factors. Uh, First, in discussions with, uh, with LPC, they recommended that uh, a transfer of air rights to 403 Lafayette would result in a non-contextual building in the area, and they urged us just to make application for a standalone at 27 East 4th Street. There's also a question about contiguity of the two properties, which uh, makes the transfer uh, not possible. So you are saying, um, in addition to the air rights issue, that LPC recommended that you build something on this street rather than on an adjacent property? Well, it's, it's our property. So, and just also, you know, we've been working uh, since 2011 for 27 East 4th Street. We have, it's a one-story building where 403 Lafayette is a three-story with a parking garage that services the community that's, you know, it's maybe not it's to its full potential, but it's, it's, it's used on a normal basis where 27 East 4th Street is a relatively dormant building. So I just want to say um, there are a number of people who have been involved in this conversation, whether it's Senator Brad Hoyleman or Assemblywoman Deborah Glick, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. So um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about the presentation, but again, I just want to go on record as saying you know we would m really prefer that you built this on Lafayette because of the merchant's house and the integrity and how important it is to this community. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you questions on the presentation that you gave, uh, to be fair. So um, in numerous letters, and again, there are so many agencies involved, including Parks, the Department of Buildings, Landmarks Preservation Commission, um, of course, and CPC, and so there's been a couple of things. Um, one is submitting final DOB construction plans. One is filing drawings to the commission. And I just, it, you have a very detailed presentation, which I appreciate. Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to make sure that you're prepared to have all these materials as well as clearly a robust protection plan in place should you decide to break ground uh, on this lot. Yes, and it'll all be approved by DOB and uh, shared with, with the public, shared with Merchants House Museum and their engineers. And landmarks. And, what and landmarks and parks. Everybody will weigh in on the plan. What has your, inter, uh, your agency communication been like? Because the last time that we met, uh, we did have representatives from the mayor's office in the room, and they mentioned that preservation engineers were going to be critical to making sure this was done well. Have you been in touch with these agencies to make sure that all of these plans are currently in place? Uh, well, we had a discussion with Parks about a week and a half ago to discuss the, uh, the thorough pre-construction survey that they want to start the process. And so we will now work with Parks and Merchants House 
to first get inside the merchant's house. Carl and his team will go inside uh, and develop a scope of work that Parks Department and the Historic House Trust wants to review and be part of. And then once we develop the scope of work, uh, we will then go in and do the thorough pre-con survey to, you know, again, to answer the scope of work issues that everybody is comfortable with. Uh, and then, then we'll decide how to move forward from there, what needs to be done to the house or what doesn't have to be done to the house to keep it safe during our construction model, uh, construction project. So without the special permits that you're seeking from us today and from the council, you are able to build a six-story as of right hotel on the lot, is that correct? We're able to build a six-story building up to 85 feet. Uh, if landmarks, if we went back to landmarks and they approved that structure, we can build that as of right without seeking any approvals. And if you were to not receive the permit and you would build the 85-foot, six-story structure, would you, are you still committed to making sure all of these protection measures are in place? Yes. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to keep our neighbor bu neighboring buildings safe. Because if anything happens to them, it triggers a call, it triggers stop work orders. Uh, we don't know how long that lasts. So if we do all our homework up front and work with our neighbors, it'll keep our construction project clear and moving along. The last thing you want to do in the middle of construction is, is to stop. Whether it's for a day, a month, six months, uh, it results in a you know, big cost to us and a detriment to the project. So if you went with the six-story structure, you'd still use the hand tools, you would still work with all of the, the special preservation engineers. I just want to ensure that you're going to use the same measures regardless. Uh, I believe we would use the same measures, again, because we want to keep the merchant's house safe. Okay. And, um, and I'll probably ask the next panel. I imagine there's people here from the merchant's house who are going to testify. No? Not today? Okay. <laughs> So you said you've tried your best to be a good neighbor, and so I'd like to know a little bit about how your conversations have been with the Merchant's House and whether, like, how receptive, uh, I guess, they all have been to what you want to do at the lot, putting aside that we'd like you to put it on Lafayette Street. Um, how have those conversations been going? I would characterize them as being difficult. Uh, the reason being that we have tried our best to be transparent and to communicate and to make our professionals available to Merchant's House. And we have had great difficulty recently in terms of scheduling meetings amongst our professionals. And prior to that, in two, three years ago, when we thought we were in the process of signing a construction protection agreement, a licensing agreement, um, how shall I characterize this? Merchant's house had cold feet. And you have been trying to build your hotel on this lot for how long? We, we've been studying the site since 2004, and our application process began in 2011. Okay, can you, I, I don't understand the cold feet reference, I'm sorry. Maybe I missed something. The lawyer who drafted the licensing agreement was then let go by Merchant's house. Okay, so um, I know that we're, we're gonna meet again to discuss this project and we're, we are on a clock. So I do wanna thank you um, for your presentation. And again, I hope you kind of take what I've said to heart and try to consider alternative options. Um, as of now, I don't really have any more questions, but I, I'm sure that we will be in touch. And I know that we're gonna be all here again on the 17th. Yeah, we're available whenever you need us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for coming to testify. Uh, the panel is dismissed. Thank you. Are there any members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, um, we will leave. We will lay this item over. We, we will lay it aside and. Um, Just say it will lay it over until the 17th. We will lay it over until the 17th. Uh, our next hearing will be on uh, pre-considered uh, LU's uh, 57, uh, Canton Place rezone, Caton Place rezoning uh, for property in Council Member 
Landers District in Brooklyn, uh, applicant 57 Ken um, Partners LLC seeks a rezoning uh, from a CA2 to an R7A uh, C24 to facilitate the development of a nine-story mixed-use building with approximately 107 apartments and ground floor retail. Uh, MIH option one is also proposed uh, with an amendment to the special Ocean Parkway district text, uh, which would result in approximately 27 affordable units. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and I will call up the first panel. Uh, Marcy Kessner. Marcy uh, Kessner, uh, Jason Little, and Sebastian. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, Sebastian, just wait. We'll get you on the next panel. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, Council, please uh, swear in the panel. Um, before responding, please state your name after hitting the button on your mic. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Uh, Marcy Kessner, I do. Jason Little, I do. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, good morning, Chair. It's uh, a pleasure to be here this morning, still this morning. Uh, my name is Marcy Kessner, and I'm a planner at Kramer Levin, which is Land Use Council to 57 Caton Partners, LLC. With me are Jason Little from Morris Ajmi Architects, and also Allison Ruddock from VHB, which prepared the environmental assessment statement in case there are any questions about uh, those findings. Um, just as an over, excuse me, a planning overview, this is an, this is an area that has been proposed for rezoning that was mapped in 1961 to reflect then current uses. It was basically ignored. Uh, nothing happened for over 50 years while the surrounding residential area has grown and thrived. Uh, it's an important link between the thriving residential neighborhoods to the west and south and Prospect Park to the north. The, it's our belief and a feeling and intent that the zoning of the site needs to be updated and brought into the 21st century to encourage housing, including affordable housing, and to avoid the introduction of new inappropriate uses, such as many storage facilities and other uses which are permitted as of right in a C82 district. Um, oh dear. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, the uh, site location, the development site is approximately 23,000 square feet. It's located on Caton Place and Ocean Parkway between East 8th Street and Coney Island Avenue in uh, Community District 7. And um, it's located one block southwest of Prospect Park in the predominantly residential Windsor Terrace neighborhood. It's well served by mass transit at Fort Hamilton Parkway and at the Church Avenue stations. Um, the existing conditions of the site are shown on this slide. Um, the site is indicated. It was um, the development site is improved with a 35-foot tall warehouse built to approximately one FAR. It was originally a roller skating rink and has been a warehouse for many years. A overflow storage uh, is a facility for a local business. Uh, to its northwest is a corner lot with approximately 100 feet of frontage on 8th Street and 50 feet of frontage on Ocean Parkway which is city-owned and mapped as parkland. And this lot contains the ramp leading to the East 8th Street, Sherman Street pedestrian overpass, which you can see in the uh, uh, lower left-hand, lower, both lower uh, images. To the west of the development site is the uh, Kensington Stable, and to the east is a church complex. The proposed rezoning area is uh, um, comprises lots one and lots four, so the 57 Caton site plus the uh, site which is mapped parkland. The, rezone, the rezoning area is currently mapped in the two block CA2 zoning district within the Special Ocean Parkway district. CA2 districts permit uses such as offices, hotels, most retail uses, gas stations and other automotive uses, medical facilities, warehouses and mini storage. No residential uses are permitted, and there are no height limits in a CA2 district. CA2 districts are meant to bridge manufacturing and heavy commercial districts, and this zoning, we believe, no longer reflects the current surrounding land uses and trends in the Caton Place area. 
In 2006, the Commission approved an easterly extension of the Ocean Parkway R7A district between Ocean Parkway and Caton Place, just west of, e of East 8th Street. The action before you today is the extension of this existing R7A district to the east of East 8th Street to allow a mixed-use development containing residences with ground floor retail, local retail use at 57 Caton Place, including approximately 27 affordable apartments. This will be permitted within a contextual bulk envelope that is more in keeping with the surrounding Windsor Terrace neighborhood con context. The park lot will be maintained as park lot, parkland and the rezoning will have no impact on the park area. This uh, shows the development site um, which is outlined in red and um, it also shows the park site to the north and east and west of the site. Uh, the um, two actions that are before the Commission today uh, in include the zoning map amendment to map an R7A C24 overlay district within the Ocean Parkway Special District. This will allow the development of a nine-story contextual residential building with ground floor local retail use. Uh, the commercial overlay will only be mapped over the development site, not on the park site. The second action consists of two zoning text amendments. One will map the 57 Caton site only within a mandatory inclusionary housing area. And the second cross-references the mandatory inclusionary housing area uh, within the text of the Special Ocean Parkway District so that it's all clean. The applicant proposes that in compliance with MIH option one, the building would provide 25% of the residential floor area, approximately 27 excuse me, apartments on site as housing affordable to households earning an average of 60% of AMI. Uh, the rezoning was approved by the community board with conditions and by the borough president with conditions. Um, the applicant has made uh, a series of uh, commitments to the borough president in writing and to the, um, and to, and uh, want to and summarize some of those. Uh, to provide 10% of the residential floor area to families earning 40% of AMI, 10% to households earning 50% of AMI, and 5% to households earning 120% of AMI, so skewing small, fewer uh, of the higher income units and lowering the, the permitted amount. To seek a locally based nonprofit housing organization to help choose the administering agent for the lease up of the affordable units. At this preliminary stage, a specific administering agent has not yet been selected. The applicant has reached a neutrality agreement with Local 32BJ, thus, the three to four building service jobs in the building will be good paying jobs with benefits. The applicant will work to discuss with DOT the potential for bioswales or other stormwater uh, strategies as part of the development. And uh, we'll also work with DOT to try to restore uh, five park, up to five parking spaces that are on the street, that, that were, that are um, not known, uh, parking spaces that are not allowed to be used for parking in front of the site to try to get to be restored for local parking. Uh, to work with local workforce organizations to maximize local hiring for skilled and unskilled labor uh, in the uh, building and to work with a local partner to advertise the affordable units. Um, uh, I th uh, the next part of our presentation is a description of the building and the designs of the building. Uh, Jason Little will uh, do that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just briefly uh, run through our design proposal. Um, the site, as Marcy, me Marcy mentioned, is a through lot. Um, there's actually a 30-foot required front yard on Ocean Parkway um, as per the special district regulations. Um, with the C24 overlay, we would have the commercial um, could occupy a portion of the rear yard, um, but otherwise for the residential uses, we're required a minimum 60-foot uh, rear yard equivalent. So we're showing two towers, or rather two building segments, uh, rising with a seven-story base and a nine-story total building height. Um, this is what, the, um, what we envision for the ground floor. Uh, basically, there's two residential lobbies. They function independently, um, but they would share a common outdoor space in, the, uh, in a portion of the rear yard area at grade. Uh, we've shown the parking ramp as separated from the stables as possible um, to maintain uh, a buffer uh, between the horses. 
Um, we've also placed a couple residential units on that landscape uh, rear yard facing Ocean Parkway, or sorry, excuse me, landscape front yard. Uh, I'm, front I'm sorry, can you just speak a little closer to the microphone? Sorry. Thank you. Will do. Um, so uh, on the Ocean Parkway side, we've uh, added two uh, residential units uh, to take advantage of the landscaped uh, front yard in that location. Um, this is a uh, illustra illustrative uh, floor plan um, where we're showing a total of 107 units, 47% uh, of which are two bedrooms or larger. Um, and uh, these are you know, somewhat large, larger uh, than normal for new development, but we think appropriate for the neighborhood. Um, and we try to make use of or to uh, optimize units with outdoor space as much as possible. Um, next. Um, the, uh, the, the neighborhood context includes many pre-war multifamily buildings along Ocean Parkway. Um, these, these buildings often featured facades articulated with multiple volumes separated by recessed courts. Uh, the facades consist of brick with decorative patterning along with punched window openings and these features uh, really inspired our design proposal. Uh, next. Um, this view from the east side of the zoning lot along on Caton Place um, illustrates uh, the possible building massing where you see the uh, seven-story base articulated into three bays. Uh, we, have in, we have inset balconies and oversized windows to uh, bring life to the facade and then the retail frontage on the Caton Place uh, is uh, activating the street. Um, this view on Ocean Parkway uh, illustrates similar design principles as the Caton Place frontage. Um, with the exception here that we've uh, included a dormer on the central bay, um, which we feel is appropriate on the wide street and also is in keeping with the character of the neighborhood of the context of the pre-war buildings. Um, and the final two slides, um, this view is uh, the proposed buildings in a Google Earth model uh, to illustrate the neighborhood context from a bird's eye view and you can see that several adjacent buildings have similar heights um, and bulk and on the following slide we've actually uh, Slide. Uh, characterize that neighborhood where you see many of the zoning lots are quite large, contain rather large buildings with uh, building heights that are similar in scale. Allison, I'm sorry. Allison Reddick is here if there are any questions about uh, the EAS or any of the findings from the environmental analysis. Great, thank you. Just uh, a couple of questions before I turn it over to my uh, colleague, Councilmember Lander. Um, you already went through the AMI ranges. Uh, what type of retail um, do you propose for the commercial space? Um, the intent is for it to be local retail, or service uses, serving the community. Uh, this is a neighborhood that has uh, a dearth of, uh, of local retail, convenient retail, and uh, this amount of space is less than 10,000 square feet. It's not going to be a large store. Uh, at this time, the uh, there's no rent up for the space. The building hasn't been, uh, hasn't, they can't start just, construction. But, they, but that, that's the intent. Uh, there were some expressions of interest at the community board level for trying, of reaching out for daycare or for uh, other types of community facility uses. And the, uh, the developer has ex expressed willingness to reach out to those sorts of uses at well, as well as when the time is appropriate. Right, okay. And, um, what are the plans um, for the protection of the stables uh, next door? Uh, in the terms stable. of the physical construction? Yeah. Um, I think I'll, I'll let uh, Jason answer that. Uh, I mean, sure, the, uh, the protection of the neighboring properties could be you know, mandated by building code and, and administrative practices. Uh, at this time, I don't think that we know what the foundation systems are, the depth of the foundations and all that, but that is investigations that we're going to um, you know, go into as, as the process moves forward. Um, but, you know, rest assured that that building um, will be uh, maintained in a safe condition and, and no uh, adverse effects should, should be caused by our development. Okay. Thank you. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to my colleagues. Thank you guys for being here. Um, 
this uh, site, though a sort of modest site in the middle of Windsor Terrace, presents a series of pretty interesting zoning challenges for us to face. Some of them the typical ones. This, uh, though, you know, the developers have done a fine job of presenting where the buildings are that are not that much uh, smaller than the one they're proposing to build. The entire interior of the neighborhood is one and two story homes in an R5B neighborhood, and those neighbors are not excited about a new building of this height, right caddy corner from their development, um, and that just presents the normal challenges that we see here of a city with a growing need for affordable housing, for housing in general, and people who like their neighborhood staying the way that it was when they moved there at some point in the past, and it's a sweet, lovely, very, one of those kind of, it's cornered on all sides in a way that makes it a lovely little area. So that's just typical challenge one, and even on these issues of what the retail will be, um, some people are excited about the possibility of a little neighborhood retail and some people fear we've got such a nice quiet, you know, residential area. We're not that excited about some mid-block retail creeping into our area. So that's set of challenges one. Now, those same neighbors um, are getting uh, a new self-storage facility being built as of right in the same CA2 zone, just catty corner to this site. And that made them all of a sudden say, oh, maybe we should, residential would be better on that other site. And they found themselves in a situation where the developer building under the as of right zoning, something with barely any space between an existing residential building. So now they're facing the challenge of that. And we've actually gone to those developers to say, would you think about building residential, even at heights you might have thought the neighbors wouldn't have been excited about in order to come up with a better urban design approach. And um, I think that has helped neighbors feel like, all right, well, at least here we have some folks who are thinking with us about urban design, trying to do this in the right way. Um, and I will say in this context that um, for this site in particular, I feel very grateful that MIH exists at all. This is not an area that has any existing affordable housing that was ever built in the neighborhood, didn't have a lot of abandonment, so there isn't housing that was developed here under HPD's programs. And this is not, you know, Chelsea or Midtown. It's not a place where someone would have done an 80-20 at any point in the past. So the fact that we're looking at getting 25% affordable units, um, and thanks to the developer's agreement skewing to the 40 and 50% AMIs, uh, is significant and meaningful, and I'm appreciative. The remaining challenge is the stable site, which the chair mentioned, which is just adjacent um, to the site to its, to its west. Uh, there's been horse riding in Prospect Park for a hundred and, as long as there's been the park, 150 years. Um, and we want to work hard to make sure it stays there for a long time to come. And I've been straight with, uh, with the development team from the beginning that beyond the anxiety about what the construction risk will be, that the risk that we are putting the stables at risk through this rezoning is very present and real to me. Um, the idea that a future developer who today could knock down the stables and build a self-storage facility as of right, uh, that someone in the future would come along and say, well, obviously we could rezone this for residential, let's just buy the site at some price that was worth selling, evict the horses. Um, and redevelop it as a residential property is a very real concern that I have. Uh, and I made that clear from the beginning. So I just want to ask, you know, for my starting question, um, you know, in your pictures, you show some horses. Uh, Councilmember Rivera leaned over and was like, are those horses? So uh, at one level, I, I think you appreciate and understand why the stables are an important part of this community and this neighborhood and give it the character that it has. Um, but I'd like to know how you have factored that into your thinking about the site, into its design, and into your land use approach in order to contribute to this area with your building in a way that strengthens and supports um, the context of having the stables in the neighborhood and doesn't do more to put it at risk and, and potentially eliminate it from the neighborhood. Well, uh, I think that for one thing, in terms of the design, and maybe I can go back I think this helps. When you look at this, uh, this image, the low red building at the left-hand side of the, uh, the elevation uh, is, the, is the stable building. Um, the, um, the design of the building was done, first of all, we're, we're rezoning just the site because we did not want to touch the stable. We did not want to put any development pressure on the stable through a rezoning. Um, the, uh, building is designed to have uh, retail commercial uses on the ground floor that would help 
buffer the stable from the residents and the residents from the stable because, um, as you know, it's conflicts that, that between those uses that can, that can be issues. We've also moved the parking garage entrance as far from the stable as possible to try to limit any sort of um, any sort of uh, horse conflicts. car conflicts, horse car f conflicts, and also pedestrian conflicts. My, the um, the stable, f uh, I understand, has uh, pony rides out on the street in front of the stable, so that would keep the cars cars from the garage entering and exiting. Keep that as far away as possible, and the sta and the. Uh, the uh, riders generally go up East, uh, up East 8th Street and then go on to the bridle path where we do have an image of uh, somebody riding a horse uh, on Ocean Parkway. So we try to keep the activity fr away from Ocean Parkway, away from the bridle path, and away from, as far from the stable as possible. So I appreciate all of that, but I guess what you said at the beginning, um, yes, of course, if you were proposing a rezoning that rezoned the stables yeah. lot to a residential rezoning, that would even further increase the development pressures that might displace the stable site. But uh, let's be real, this development is increasing the displacement risk and development pressures on the stable site. You just need to look at this image to get it. It's not complicated. It was on the zoning map, and so while I appreciate that you have put the parking garage entrance mm -hmm. as far from the stables as you could. I, I guess I'm not really satisfied that that is a development approach that is invested in helping preserve the stables uh, and keep them as part of this neighborhood as they've been. So, well, as you as you know, Council Member, and, and we understand and we understand the importance of the stables to the community and and to us as well. I mean, to the developers as well. Um, we have uh, tried to work with the prior ownership of the stable and the current ownership of the stable to try to assist them. Um, and we have worked with, uh, we have tried to work with you over the past year also to, to provide assistance in some way to uh, ensure that the stable's long, long standing um, history uh, continues. Uh, it's something that we will hope to continue to work with you on to try to develop some sort of a framework which would help to ensure the stable's long, long term uh, success and long term. Uh, existence next door to to the proposed building. So I appreciate that you have the, that the development team here has worked in good faith with my office. I guess I want to make clear to my colleagues we're not yet to a place where we have a satisfactory result for that. Um, we had hoped that the city would actually be able to acquire the stables. They were in bankruptcy a year ago. We had arranged the city financing. The city put in an offer, but someone else came in and bought the building essentially out of bankruptcy. Um, and that's not you guys. You don't own the site. You can't force that owner to, to, to do things that in the short and the long term would provide more stability and security for the stables. Um, but at this point, despite those best efforts on your part, um, uh, you know, we're not there yet to my satisfaction. We don't have much in place other than keeping the parking garage far from the stables site that's going to help us have confidence that we're preserving the stables here. And again, partly it's about the stables being right there. It's as much or more to me about preserving riding in the park, which again, we've had for more than a century. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to feel good about my tenure in office or this action in particular if we allow you know, the kind of general course of real estate development to eliminate riding that's been in the park for more than 100 years or contribute to its elimination. So I appreciate that you'd like to get there. I appreciate that you have um, worked with my office to do it. Um, but we, got, we still have some ways to go. So before I can give a recommendation to my colleagues on how to vote for this property, um, we have some work to do to figure out if there isn't something we can do. And obviously we're constrained by legal and financial and equine forces, some of which are not within the, the neat bounds of our powers. But on the other hand, this is something unique and wonderful. It's the last remaining stables in Brooklyn, seeing those horses in the park, knowing that young people, including kids with disabilities, have their first opportunity to get out in the park on those horses. Um, it's not, of course, it's something that gives the neighborhood its character. And it's something that just elevates the human spirit in our city, and it is our responsibility to do all we can to make sure that continues. So I'm going to ask you guys to work harder over the next few days and weeks to get to a place where 
um, we can feel confident that in addition to the affordable housing, in addition to meeting some of the community board and borough president's goals, and I appreciate your work with them to get to a place where they voted to approve the project with modifications, we can also have more confidence than I have today uh, that we will be preserving Kensington Stables and riding in the park for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lander. Um, thank you very much for your testimony today. Um, I'll now call up the next panelist, uh, Sebastian Tertillian. Uh, I'm going to have the council. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You may, sure. you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya, Council Member Lender, and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> My name is Sebastian Tertullian, and I'm a staff member at 32BJ. I'm here to testify on behalf of the 80,000. 32 BJ members who clean and maintain buildings throughout New York City. As you know, we are the largest property service workers union in the country with over 35,000 members working at residential buildings <clears throat> like the one being proposed for 57 Caton Place. We are happy to report that um, 57 Caton Partners LLC, an affiliate of AVU Equities, has committed to creating high quality building service jobs and we want to see this project move forward. It is our estimation that when the building opens, it will be staffed with approximately five building service workers. And these jobs will be good jobs with family sustaining wages that will allow workers to live and work in New York City with dignity and security. So by making a commitment to good jobs, we believe that AVU Equities has done the economically responsible thing. And these jobs will positively affect the well-being of the community for years to come. This is why we hope that you will support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item? Uh, seeing none. Um, close the hearing on this. I now close the hearing on this, this application. On this application. Okay, uh, that concludes today's hearing. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, uh, council and land use staff uh, for attending. Uh, the land use items that were uh, voted are referred to uh, the full committee uh, and this meeting is uh, hereby adjourned. <laughs>